Oh, hi, I'm Ryan Fisher. I'm the creator and writer of You Know How This Ends, as well as the graphic novel Torchlight Lullaby. And you are watching and listening to the incredible Two Geeks Talking with the one and only Curtis Asso. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a returning guest. It has been far too long to the point that I don't even know if the Tigers were good or the Mariners were good or anything like that. Probably not on both cases, but <laughs> cartoonist, graphic designer, first time author with an amazing new book called You Know How This Ends. We are joined by the ever talented Ryan Fisher. How are you doing today? Hey, good, man. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. It has to be at least five to, I'm thinking five or eight years at least since you were last on the show. Yeah, I think it would have been either shortly after the Torchlight Lullaby Kickstarter ended or book came out or right before it. So that would have been 20, God damn it, math, 16. <laughs> so yeah, about 2016 probably. But you're back with a brand new book, an amazing, amazing novel so far. I, I'm jumping ahead of myself as I do. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. My name is Ryan Fisher. I've been working in comics for roughly 15 years now. Started in web comics. You know, I was one of those guys that caught the uh, Penny Arcade bug. So had to do the me and my friends geek comic strip for a couple of years. And completely fell in love with the medium. Did another strip for a couple of years called Sometime After, which led to my graphic novel, Torchlight Lullaby, in 2016, which is the last time you and I talked shop. Since then, I've dealt with a, a pretty bad injury that kind of put me on the shelf for a couple of years. Um, but I've been back on it for about two years now, three years now. Um, so I'm currently working on a pretty massive graphic novel called what's left of me and because i needed uh, a break for the drawing hand i uh, dove in and wrote the novel that we're kind of here to to talk shop about today so you're staying busy i'm glad that you're you're healed for good news especially for, yeah. for all of us that love your work was it something you can talk about or is this something yeah no that... it's one of those weird things that i still don't have a great diagnosis of it the easiest way to explain it is in the middle of my back, right off the spine on the left-hand side, I have a never-ending 24-7 muscle spasm. It feels like there's a golf ball in right off my spine. You know when you get a Charlie horse in your knee, or your, not knee, your calf? It's like that in the middle of my back all the time. I still have it, but uh, I finally got insurance to kind of approve giving me Botox. And now, basically, I just can't feel the middle of my back. It's enough that I can do some work and take some breaks and stretches and make some progress. But it cramped to one day and never let go. Not the well, best. No, no, no. What people who don't know me are probably going to see now is my head's a little crooked. So I've had muscle skeletal issues my whole life. So it's probably related to that. But I still don't have like a concrete name or anything to call it. It just cramped one day and never stopped. Let's talk about something that's more positive, too, when it comes to being a first-time <laughs> novelist, a first-time author, which is a great feather in your cap. You've always been a wonderfully creative person. Oh, thank you. You Know How This Ends is, is an interesting title. It's an amazing book so far that I've read. I can't wait to finish it because it has hooked me. If we didn't do it this early in the morning, I still would have been reading this by the time we uh, had our actual interview. <laughs> Tell us about you know how this ends and how this process came about and why this novel is important to you. So the book is kind of a take on second chances not being what you expect them to be. Uh, it involves a protagonist named Ben Durham, who at the very start of the book is being released from prison after being found not liable for the death of his girlfriend. He is given the opportunity to be a caretaker at a newly developing apartment complex that's being kind of built off of an old remote tuberculosis sanitarium up in like remote Washington state. So it's a story that has to deal with him kind of processing all he's been through, his own guilt on what happened, as well as what is currently happening to him in this building. 
And it's a story that looks at, you know, guilt and flashbacks and paranoia. And it was just kind of a fun exercise to play. And I've always been such a huge fan of horror and like Stephen King and things like that. I just wanted to play in that toolbox a little bit. So this was my excuse. Well, it definitely had feels of Stephen King. From what I've been reading it, you're, you're definitely diving into that territory. It's subtle enough, and it's the scenes. I can visualize them, which is great when you're reading a book. If you can visualize what's happening from a reader's perspective, that's the best headspace you can be in. I mean, maybe not for horror, but I mean, it's still a great read overall. Oh, that is how horror works. Otherwise, <laughs> it's just weird words, man. <laughs> What's the most misunderstood aspect about the horror genre for prose that people who don't follow it misunderstand? Ooh, the most. It's not all blood and guts. It's not gross. It doesn't even necessarily have to be inappropriate to be good horror. Yes, there's something to be said about visceral reactions you can generate with that kind of stuff. And like I use a little of it. Like there's some injuries and things like that in this. But I think the most misunderstood thing, like with a scary movie, it's jump scares, right? And there are people who love that, and there are people who don't. Like me personally, I don't like a lot of horror movies. I don't like excessive gore. It doesn't do anything to me. Like to me, it almost becomes comedy almost. But like if it's not trying to be funny or if it's not in that great genre of so bad, it's funny. Yeah. It just takes me out of it. Like, I'm not a Texas Chainsaw guy. I'm not, a, you know, it's okay. It's just not who I am. It's why I think I love Stephen King so much. And why, you know, like earlier I referenced The Thing, which to me is like the perfect horror movie. So I think the biggest misconception is they're not all that. It's actually like your favorite episode of, I don't know, CSI or Law and Order or whatever but it just has a, a twist on it, a bend on it. And that's what can make it horror. I, I only more recently, I think 10 years ago or so, saw uh, Friday the 13th for the first time or oh, yeah. uh, or uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. The only one I actually saw on film was Freddy versus Jason, which people pan as like a horrible Ooh, film. That's not right, start. Uh, yeah, well, that's that's the, was the, my first official film of that stuff. Uh, I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was just a good fun <laughs> time. True. Like it was, it was meant to be funny, in my opinion. But Saw Two was a better horror film besides yeah. the grossness of it. But the psychological side of things was more entertaining to me than anything. That is a very good one to start with. That's my my dive into horror is very, very shallow. <laughs> have you ever actually seen The Thing, now that we brought that up? No, I have seen, sorry, I have seen The Thing. I've seen The Thing, okay. I've seen uh, Invader of the Body Snatchers, I've seen uh, The Shining multiple times. Um, sure. Uh, cl I've seen classics like that. Psychological horror to me just does something a lot better because you're thinking about what's happening. And It wasn't until I got into film like into actual being a student of film and uh, taking at university and understanding the genres and understanding concepts from a, a, a blocking perspective and from a, a 3D space perspective and why certain genres need the space and others don't. Mm -hmm. Even visually from a camera lens, there's so many avenues that you don't understand and, and unless you're in the space specifically and then you understand why you enjoy it. Sometimes you can just shut off your brain and enjoy something for the sake of enjoying it. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. I think uh, for me, the gateway into horror as far as, you know, outside of King was Twilight Zone. Yes. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people don't think of that as horror, but yeah. to me, that's perfect horror. Uh, like not obviously everyone, but add on to the last question you add, like what is misconceived about horror? Because people, I mean, rightfully so, classify that as sci-fi. But to me, it's also horror. And if I were to put like my flag somewhere in the horror realm, it would be in that side of things, creatively. And I'm not the only one. There's a lot of horror out there that gravitates more to that side of storytelling than bodies hanging up on meat hooks in a basement somewhere type of vibe. 90s or 2000s re-release of the twilight zone and that other that continuation of the 60s and 70s version of it was it was really well done but then you take it a step further from that and you got black mirror which is oh god much yeah. in, in that same aspect of twilight zone just for 
the 2020s and beyond. If you ever go on a Twilight Zone kick, watch the original Twilight Zone, the 90s, 2000s version, and then dive right into Black Mirror. And I think you're set pretty much for what is the true epitome of psychological horror. This creative process must have been interesting for you because while everyone likes to be like Stephen King, it is very hard to emulate his style. Why is Stephen King an important author for you as a creative person? There's probably two novelists that I would say really kind of sparked me um, or sparked this part of my brain. One, Stephen King, which I've been reading since I was 10 years old, uh, got me into the horror genre itself. Um, and the other one is Paul Tremblay, mm -hmm. who is probably best known for A Head Full of Ghosts. Um, fantastic, fantastic horror author. I don't know, man. I've just always loved the the pacing, the vibe. And as someone who works in a visual medium 90% of the time, it was a really cool challenge to see if I could do it with just language. So what did you learn about yourself as you were writing this novel? The non-profound answer is I love this shit. Like it was, it was a blast, man. I like the challenge of it. I like see, having to draw. It sounds like it's a burden, but there is something to be said about being able to start a project and release it in four months mm. as compared to the couple of years. Cause I do everything. I write and draw and ink and color. Like I'm a one-stop shop when it comes to comics. Yeah. So that process takes forever. So being able to, you know, write something, refine it, boil it down and then release it was kind of the, I mean, if we're going to be honest, it's the uh, the high I needed creatively to like, okay, I'm still doing this. I'm still here. People still know I exist. So it's as much a love project as it is honestly a vanity project. Like I just, I needed that hit because I have not released anything since Torchlight in 2016. So this was kind of the, let's get something out there. Let's do it. When it comes to then getting this proofread, when it comes to getting it edited there, who was your sounding board or did you have a sounding board when it came to this process overall? And and what did, what did you learn about someone else reading it? Sure. I think like most people, the first sounding board is my partner. I am both lucky and a little cursed that she's blunt, man. <laughs> if she didn't like it, like... There was a couple of chapters in there that it was like scrapped whole cloth and reworked and everything else. But after that, I went through Fiverr and hired a couple of different editors who took passes at it. Honestly, once I was really happy with how it was being received by those people, I said, all right, let's do it. And then I sent it out to uh, a couple of friends. Uh, one of them, I don't know. If, do you know Greg Smith? Have you talked to him yet? I don't think I've talked to him, but the name sounds familiar. Okay, I know because you talk with Horsley and stuff. It's There's kind of a little pocket of independent creators up here in Washington State, and Greg's a, a great dude. Nice. And if not, I'll put you in contact with him because he's a fun interview, a fun dude. Sure. Um, but anyway, I sent it to Greg, and he's another one of those that if he gives me the okay, I trust it. And once kind of all of those you know stars aligned, it was, let's give this a shot and see how it goes. That's awesome. Titles are important, obviously, when it comes to not only comics, but books as well, too. This particular title, is it just a typical nod to the horror genre? Is that the reason why you chose it? Or was there other titles that you thought might have been either better than this? So I worked through a bunch of titles. The non-spoilery answer is you will know the answer to that question when you finish the book. <laughs> so it it is intentional. It is in there. It it, it matters. The title is obviously the window into the book itself. Visuals obviously are important for the cover as well, too. Yeah. I mean, as a graphic designer and amazing creative person that you are, you're visually, I'm sure, trying to draw people in with it. And and it's a great, I think it's a great cover. Oh, Dark House. To me, it felt similar to, um, gosh, why am I blanking on that classic horror film? Thing in The Shining? Yes, thank you. Is when I was reading into the, the first couple of pages, driving up to that place, it felt like, mm -hmm. wow, this is this is the shining. This is like this would be the perfect iteration of the shining in 2023 type deal. <laughs> the uh the opening scene to Kubrick's film has always kind of stuck in my head. Uh matter of fact, 
whether or not it's in the book when I'm done, but the what's left of me opens in a very similar way. There is something about showing real quickly to the reader that you are in some isolation has always grabbed me. It's um a lot like the thing to the Carpenter film. Yeah. Um, where you just see nothing but snow all around you and you instantly know, yeah, you're on your own out here. Um, it's just such a good hook for the genre that I love playing with it and just starting from there. And it's it's kind of what got the ball rolling for me creatively. So that's why it, like I wear the King references proudly on my sleeve. Not that it's anything like King, but... I, you know, it, it is, it's, it's very intentional to try to get that vibe right off the gate. So readers kind of know what to expect. But that's what makes it great though. You're already in familiar territory with people that love the book and love the genre itself. Cleared your creative headspace. You got some energy back up from what I'm hearing, at least in your voice. I can, I can tell that you've gotten your, your creative juices back when it comes oh, to yeah. this process. So I can't wait to see this this next book. Character design is always important in comics, but it's just as important in novels. What was your basis of your characters and, and how did you find interacting with them as you were writing this? Did they speak to you? Ooh, I have not answered that one yet. Shit, the honest answer is probably not that satisfying. Uh, but the honest answer is when I write, I kind of hallucinate the characters, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like it's the best way to describe the price process is I kind of see a loose, blurry movie in my head. And I think it was just a matter of literally sitting here staring at the ceiling fan until they started to feel like whole people to me. Um, they're not really based on anyone concrete. It started as a hypothetical, what would I do in this situation type story and tried to build the world around it and have plausible actors in it. Speaking of world building, because obviously when it comes to creating a comic, you're building a world visually in that respect. And obviously as you're reading this novel, you can feel the world building every at every single page because you're very direct when it comes to your descriptions of the scenes and of the uh, perfect example is cleaning off the bird shit in the in the fifth floor window i mean that was just hilarious <laughs> to me it just is like you just really dug deep you went right in there yeah. and you dove right into it like almost you know up to the up to the elbows in, in bird shit i thought it was i thought it was a great visual reference because i'm like Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> and then staring down and just your visuals were great. Your visuals were captivating is what I'm trying to say. And so I thought that was really interesting, especially in the character interactions and and his headspace as well too. You're you're talking about the visuals he's seeing in his mind. You're you're really describing it clearly and cleanly and it's it's a great way to get into that persona that you you absolutely know nothing about so i i think as a as a main character i think ben was really well done thank you man i appreciate that so <laughs> what i'm leading into is is the creative process when it comes to your character development and design you even though you're staring into space and, and looking at this you got the inkling from your past experiences i'm sure in some way shape or form either consciously or subconsciously uh, how did that fit in terms of when you started the book to when you finished it? And did you find it actually conclusive? Were you happy with how the book ended? Were you happy with how the character was developed? So the, the rough version I had uh, in mind for Ben was I wanted, I started with a guy who was broken. That was kind of what I put down on paper. It's, a guy whose life has been shattered through no real cost of his own. Like he's there's responsibility there, but he wasn't the one that set everything in motion, which was important to me. And it was as loose as, so I put this broken guy in this situation and then I just wrote until he told me what happened. Like I didn't have an ending I had a rough idea of an ending in mind, but 
as far as the character development and all that goes, it wasn't like heavily scripted. Um, maybe if I was a more, you know, profound prolific author, maybe I'd get there. But the the truth in this experience was it was okay, I know who this guy is to start. And I just let him run and kind of see where it took me. Was that also because you were dealing with your your back injury and everything like that as well too? Was that kind of a subconscious oh, reference? Damn, therapist Kurt. Um, honestly, maybe. Yeah, maybe that is kind of where I pulled from. Uh, it wasn't intentional. Shit, I hadn't thought of that. But yeah, maybe. It, it very well could be. At least it could be why it was so easy to get in that headspace. Mm -hmm. And while his is circumstances and not physical, um, there is kind of something of, well, this wasn't my fault. How do I pick up the pieces again? So, yeah, maybe. Maybe that is why I jumped into that space. I mean, I haven't been doing this for 15 years and not catch up on some references in some way, shape, or form. But Because if, well, I I if I wasn't going to be an IT, I was going to be a psychologist. So. <laughs> Well, I just wish you would have told me and I could have cleared off the couch first. I should be sitting there and not here. You have to make money in some way, shape, or form. That because unfortunately that's what drives not only the creative process, but it also drives your ability to live. And so jumping into a new medium like like being an author, how are you going to be marketing this particular book? And is the horror genre still popular in written format compared to, say, the films that are dotting the industry so i'm very much still learning how to navigate the prose space i know how to market a comic i've done that enough i have those social circles kind of well established i know you know the parameters for comic shows and all that like i've got that world kind of down um as far as the prose one i'm still very much learning it I am very happy with the initial numbers I've pulled from uh, Barnes and Noble sales of the book, as well as like through Gumroad and things like that. How to sustain that? I'm not, to be completely honest with you, I'm not sure yet. Uh, I'm hoping to get into the kind of book talk sphere a little bit. Uh, I've sent the, the PDF of it out to a couple of people. And the eventual hope is if it is not collected as a physical novel in this state, that I might put out a author-based kind of anthology of horror stories in the somewhat near future if I do another couple of them. I think that's good. It's not a short story by any stretch of the imagination. No. It's a hundred and some hundred and twenty pages, something like that. Yeah, as far as the PDF goes. I think if you were to actually size it, scale it down to like a standard I don't know, what is it, six by nine, maybe novel, whatever the ballpark for a prose book was. Um, I think it was like a 200 page book when it gets to that size. So it's it's not a huge story, but it's not a short either. It has been a long time since I've actually sat down and read a, a book, to be perfectly honest. Because, <laughs> well, I mean, to, to be fair, everything's digital, everything's online, yeah. everything's quickly available. Either it's it's in your ear from an audio perspective or it's in a PDF format that, that you're scrolling through till three in the morning reading. And so we consume our media as a lot differently than, say, the in the 80s and 90s when the medium wasn't quite at that clear perspective. So in your opinion, is it better to have a physical book of you know how this ends, or is it better to have a digital version of it? For me personally, physical. Um, as you can probably see by the bookcase behind me, and there's another one that's larger to my left, I'm a physical book guy. That being said, this is only digital because I'm kind of tipping my toes out into this space and let's see how it goes rather than immediately run for a print run and have the joy of storing those in my garage for a couple of years. <laughs> um that being said, I've been pleasantly surprised with the amount of people that like just throwing it on an iPad and reading. Oh. Um, that's how my partner reads everything. God, Casey, I give her so much crap for this as a creative, but she probably reads four or five books a week and just pours through them on her phone or on an iPad or whatever. So I've seen people absolutely enjoy that medium, consume that medium that way. And apparently she's not alone. Because the numbers were pleasantly high. 
Oh, and cool. I have done marginal marketing. Awesome. That, that's great to hear. So will we have this in an audio format? Oh, I don't know. Because uh, I really think if you get a good voice actor, this would be a perfect another avenue when it comes to this type oh. of process. You know, I haven't considered that, but um, I have a couple of friends that are voice actors, at least. I don't Tom or Seen, you know Tom, don't okay. you? Oh, Tom would He's be done great. some audiobooks, so oh, I guess yeah. I know at least one person that's done audiobooks. So I don't know. Maybe I butter Tom up and see if I can pay him a couple hundred bucks and get this done. I'm not sure. Um, I haven't considered that yet, but it's certainly plausible. I Just think it would be a great album. Spot. Exactly, yeah. Tom, do this book. What? <laughs> sure, okay, whatever. No, he, I think it would be good. I think he, even if you had a narrator space or whatever, too, or other yeah. characters, etc. I, I think it would be another avenue to kind of look into for 2024. Yeah, you're not, I mean, you're not wrong. If I'm being frank, I consume most of my books through Audible audiobooks while I'm sitting here drawing and stuff. I've got them going. So yeah, maybe I hadn't considered it. Like I said, this is such a new kind of place for me to navigate that. I don't know if it's a confidence thing. I don't know if it's uh there is a part of me that is like, okay, is it, is this something that makes sense? Is this something people would want, or am I just throwing resources at it? Hmm. And I, this is just kind of, you know, a creator being honest and, you know, I don't know, vulnerable is the word, but just being sincere in that wasn't sure how this would be received. Um, I'd done one like short story last October called meeting the green lights. I mean, to be frank, probably 15 people read, but it was enough that I liked the process that it was like, okay, let's try this for this one. But this is still such a feeling out process that I don't know, you know, like even if say we did do a print run, I have no idea what number I should even print at this point. I'm going to have to reach out to a bunch of other creators and kind of see what makes sense for an independent author. There's a, a guy out here, wonderful dude uh, named Todd Downing who does, they're called airship, oh, I'm going to screw up the word, Daedalus. It's like the giant Zeppelin balloons. He does like a kind of rocketeer Zeppelin type of vibe book series. Fantastic books. I've only read a couple of them, but they're really good. But he's been a lot of help, and he's actually one that I'm kind of like, when I get to this point, I'm going to really lean on him pretty hard as far as, you know, what are the next steps? Who do I contact? Things like that. Um, but yeah, there's so much of this that like you're catching me early in this process, man. So I'm not sure yet. Well, I feel honored that you're coming on the show after all these years and to talk about oh. your very first book as well, too, because I, I think it's just I've tried to create this space as as free and as creative as possible for 15 years. And, and I like the fact that longtime friends like yourself are creating different mediums that are, are energizing them and entertaining the masses and that you're having fun with it because if you're not having fun with whatever you're doing, whether you're on this side of the mic or, or on that side of the mic, then why are you doing it? What, what is life to you? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'll gas you up a little bit when it was like, okay, who do I talk to? You were one of those people I knew would understand that my heart's in this and would kind of respect it and treat it kindly. And I mean, you and I have always talked shit to each other. Granted, mostly it's sports based, <laughs> but still like, I don't know, you were, you've always been a really kind, friendly voice. You've done this professionally. You've done this cleanly, succinctly for so long for yeah. so many people that, yeah, you were one of the very first people I thought of. Well, I appreciate it. That's it's good because um I would rather wrap up twenty twenty three with you than you know something else. Oh. <laughs> Besides, the tigers suck anyhow, so it's not gonna. T- <laughs> <laughs> From the editing side of things, and you touched on it earlier, what was cut out of the book? So what has been cut out is what you are about to read. Oh, and that is I delved a lot more into what the sanitarium used to be. Mm-hmm. There was a couple of chapters that they weren't flashbacks in the sense that it wasn't uh, like Ben experiencing them, 
but it was kind of a where you shift perspective a little bit and you see what used to happen there and what it used to be like for Francis and a couple of the other characters. One of those chapters was hard to cut. Like, I'll be honest, there was a couple of things I really loved in there. But um, this was before I sent it off to the editing stage. In fact, this might have been when uh, my partner and I were talking and she shut it down. While I liked a lot of what happened and I liked some of the backstory it added, I really wanted the reading process to be fast paced and clean and succinct. And I wanted this to be the type of thing that you could pick up at noon, be done at four or five and just kind of enjoy the process, if that makes sense. Yeah. And once I started playing in that part of the world a little bit, it got a little chewy. chewy. It kind of slowed down just enough that it was like, you know, is this adding enough to the reader? Like it was fun for me, but was it necessary to tell Ben's story, which is the story I'm really trying to tell here. So those got left kind of on the cutting room floor, but that was about it as far as what was left out. The rest of it was pretty much there from the first draft and it was just kind of molded and tweaked as I went along. Is there something from that? cutting room floor bits that you may bring back in future stories only way i could see that happening is if i go back to this world again okay which is possible the ending is done in a way that it is possible to go back whether or not i do i'm not sure yet this is kind of one of those things where i seem to be a little different or weird from a lot of my friends in this space i take a lot of pride in enjoy reading stories that have concrete beginning and ends if that makes sense a lot of creators and a lot of stuff i like to you know enjoy want to make series and they want like you know big arching projects to tell big stories over multiple volumes that's never been me and it might be because i do everything myself you know what i mean yeah. but i've always enjoyed and i it really hit home when i was doing like comic cons for torchlight mm -hmm. and that is here it is. It's done. Beginning and everything. One price. Enjoy the story. You don't have to keep following me. You don't have to wait two years to figure out what happens. It's all right in front of you. So I have taken that to the pros, I think. That being said, I could dip back in, but there is no plan at this moment to. Your style has always been, here's a one shot. Like, yeah. Like, there's, and there's nothing wrong with that, that process because being time conscious of your readers and the people that are paying money for the work that you're creating, it's not to say it, it, the quality is, is great enough that they'll keep coming back with whatever project you create. I think the marketing side of things could use a little bit of a brush up. I think you don't have to follow me is a little, little rough, you know, please continue to follow me for my next project would be a better True. alternative. True. Not, no. not, yeah, you don't have to follow me. It's good. You know, here, I'm just, I'm just quickly here. Yeah, no. That was, that was two friends talking, not I the, know. I know. I but know. no, it, it's the, you don't have to follow in anticipation to figure out how the hell, what you just invested in ends. <laughs> it's the but, cleaner way of saying that. Yeah, But that's good though. You know, we're so used to content being short to the point snippets we don't get the full story on a lot of stuff because in the medium nowadays whether it's prose or whether it's in in comics or whether it's visually through social media we're so inundated with everything we're so mm -hmm. slammed with so much content that we don't have time to think and breathe and consume the medium as we need to and i think with this story and with with your work itself you have that ability to sit back once you're done and breathe and think and ruminate on on what you've just read and what you've just visually seen. So I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you, man. No, you know, we were talking just a little bit ago about like the book marketing side of things. And if I'm being frank, that is why there are so many series out there is it's so much easier to market the same thing over and over again. That's why movie studios keep doing remakes and sequels and why they tell you to you know if you go to any sort of creative seminar they say kind of release snippets of it or even the webcomic model now is you know consistent updates make them enjoyable but it's 
you want to do a slow build, slow hook, build your audience over time that way and steer them all to the same project for a long period of time. I've completely shot myself in the foot in that sense, but I do so willingly because it's just, that's not the realm I want to be in. Um, If there was like a creator whose kind of style I have always appreciated, it might be Chris Straub, Mm -hmm. who has kind of done like the Straub universe, that it's, these are not related projects. Um, If you're going to dig my work, you're going to dig it because it's me and my voice, but has never shied away from killing his own darlings if that makes sense where this is the end of it and i don't have to go back i'm glad you loved it i loved it let's see what's next um and i think that's kind of how i'm wired and i just think it it depends on on what you enjoy because we're only here for a limited amount of time so we enjoy what we enjoy and you know i'm glad that you're creating what you're creating because yeah you know it makes sense and it's it's fun you're gonna have a good time either way Ah, thank you you know, if you were a brand new person in the in the prose world in terms of creating your own novels, where would you start? So, I mean, first you have to love books. Like, if you don't, then what the hell are you doing? But once that's aside, where I really kind of got this ball rolling, there are two resources that I really highly recommend. The first is the author, fantasy author, Brandon Sanderson. He does a lot of like lectures. He has a whole series on YouTube where he's talking. I think it's a BYU and it's for a creative writing class. And it's amazing that he breaks down how to do the world building. What are the tools in this tool chest? How to develop characters? It is a college level master's class that is entirely available for free on YouTube. I think he also has some stuff behind a paywall. Hello, Bumble. Welcome back. The other one I would say is, ironically enough, through the service masterclass. Neil Gaiman does a series. And I cannot tell you how many times I went back and followed that. And it truly, sincerely feels like Neil was kind of holding my hand as I was wading into these waters for the first time. It's kind of one of those things that if I ever get the chance to meet him again, I've talked to him a couple of times at Comic-Cons, but like what he did in that masterclass is such a service to me creatively and helped pull me out of the funk I was in with the injury and the long slog creatively. I highly recommend anybody, even thinking about wanting to write so much as a short story to pay for the one month membership. It's only like 10 bucks, 15 bucks, something like that. And just go through those classes. It was such an amazing resource. Neil is such a great teacher from here on out. Anytime any parent or anybody comes up and says, how do I get into this? That's going to be my answer. I did the Aaron Sorkin one for film. Yeah or in television. And I, there is so much, just, just even something as simple as, you know, just trying to visualize and thinking about blocking as you're writing and things like that. Like you can take that side of things from a visual perspective, especially in, in comics as well, and put that into your prose if you wanted to combine your mediums. Oh yeah. I watched that one. Trudy Blooms was decent. I picked up a little bit here and there. I think Dan Brown, I think, also had one that wasn't bad. But Neil's was the one that really gave me the permission to do this. He does it in such an engaging, friendly way that it's cool to just experiment and play. And it kind of gives you the tools on how to narrow it down that I can't promote it enough for anybody that might want to get into this sphere. Because like, if we're being honest... Your two real main probably target audience people are other creatives or people who want to be creatives. So if you are in that second kind of realm, that is two resources that I could not put my endorsement on higher. I'll have to re-up my subscription and and revisit that. (laughs) Now's the time. I think it's always pretty cheap at the start of the year because a lot of people, you know, their resolution is to get back into whatever it is. So I bet you now is kind of that opportunity. Because language is, is so important. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? <laughs> well, I swore and had to suck on a bar of soap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, um, 
I think we're going to go back to Stephen King again. Um, reading that in probably fourth or fifth grade and getting nightmares off of a novel and just kind of loving that process, if that makes sense. It was kind of like an adrenaline hit nightmare, like not a, oh God, I'm freaking out, but like a, holy shit, what was that type of vibe? And I think ever since then, like, I read a lot, but they're almost always horror books or drama books. I cannot get through most nonfiction books. I can't do historical fiction. I don't like sword and sorcery. There's something about that adrenaline hit. And you can only get it from prose to me because it's your own imagination that's fueling the fear. And you naturally kind of put in your own fears, your own you know, if I say this is a scary monster, it has this quality, this quality, and this quality, you fill in everything else that would freak you out. And as somebody who approaches creativity as an artist first, there's so much power in letting somebody else design the monster, if that makes sense, yeah. or design the the hero or the love of Trist. So yeah, that to me is the power in it, is that the reader is such an active participant. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice? What's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that stuck with you in your various creative journeys? Hmm. I don't know if it's creative advice. Like I can't boil it down to a succinct like quote and say, you know, I have this on the wall type of vibe. But I think, and this kind of speaks to who I am creatively to a bit, I've always had such a great respect for David Bowie. And the reason for that is he never followed the pressure to do what other people expected him to do. And each new project was, what am I feeling? What am I into? And let's play in that environment. Um, the fact that one amazing voice and songwriter and creator could start with like folk from the 60s and also have one of the most like I don't know, like the quintessential pop albums of the 80s to then you know right before that do blue-eyed soul and release like a motown album in young americans follow pop stuff with what's essentially industrial electric you know nine inch nail stuff and then just kind of riff for the, his entire career. And it was all because it was stay true to what's inspiring you now and what you want to be. And it's going to be for the people who like it and everybody else, you know, I'll catch you in the next project and see if you like that one more. I think that's been the creative guidance for me my whole life is don't chase a trend. Don't chase what you want to be perceived as chase what you actually are enjoying in this moment go with your whole being a hundred percent and the people who are going to like it are going to find it and everybody else if they don't like it hopefully they'll catch you on the next one and if not that's okay everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today who was that for you i think I think that would probably be my stepdad, who I sadly lost about a decade ago now. When he was first coming into my life, we kind of bonded over uh, his love. I was a kid, his peanuts. And like, as you can see behind me, the Snoopy, it's been such a prominent thing in my life. But it was the power, the relatability of creativity. And, you know, all of my parents have always been very supportive in that. But there was something about getting to establish a relationship with someone you love around that type of medium, that creativity, that has always inspired me and given me such a passion to do this, that I think that is kind of the one guiding light of this is how important this stuff can be for people. From a professional standpoint, you're, of course, a creative success when it comes to comics, as well as your newest novel. You know how this ends. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yes, because I finished it. Like there are several barometers of success. Where I am at, at this stage in my life, if I 
finish a project, if I gave it everything I had, and if I can release it, I am happy to put my flag in that as a success. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? For a long time, if I'm going to be like, you know, kind of frank here, for a long time, I didn't deal with them well. I took them as ego hits quite a bit. Somewhere along the line, it kind of clicked that to be a success, you have to embrace failure. Because if you run from it, if you're afraid from it, or you let it define you, you're never going to get to success. Um, In its own way, failing is a form of success because it means you have recognized something didn't work. Um, And whether that's you discovering it and like you're trying to create something and you end up just wasting time and resources, or if you release something and you thought it was good and it flops, Um, there's a lot of positive power in that if you are willing to approach it and try to separate the the disappointment of it from what are people telling you about it and what needs to change for the next thing a failure is a good thing unless you let it stop you the younger generation are looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way whether it's as a comic artist graphic designer or now as a prose author maybe you're inspiring them down a creative path in the future how can they inspire the generation that follows them be sincere there's a whole lot of people that are approaching this trying to make the next spider-man trying to hit on whatever is currently popular i think if you truly want to inspire your other people and to feel great about what you've created it is to create for yourself first and let your passion come through that way. There's not a lot of great projects that started as I want to be the next blank. It's Jeff Smith sitting down and making these weird marshmallows, squishy characters and creating bone the beginning of Superman, which is the two Jewish kids saying, I want a world where we feel all and powerful and nothing can touch us. There's sincerity in everything that has lasting power and sticks. And if you want to inspire people, it's find your own sincerity and give it everything you have and don't apologize for it and don't change it in the hopes to hit something that'll be popular. If your life was a comic book or a novel, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Mm. It would probably be titled shit. I shouldn't do that again. (laughs) And the soundtrack would be, see, you're talking to a music guy. Like that is, that is such a prevalent thing to me. So trying to come up with one vibe or one era for a soundtrack, I would say the soundtrack to my life should be dictated by Danny Elfman. Okay. His weirdness, his sometimes dark, depressing solo stuff, the quirky Oingo Boingo stuff, the beautiful. If I had to say I need one person to create my soundtrack, I trust that dude. So I'll say it's it's Elfman. I want so badly to see some sort of soundtrack between Elfman and Atticus Ross and oh. Trent Reznor. Oh. I think those three, I mean, granted, they'd want to kill each other in a studio, I'm assuming, but what could come out of that could be really fucking cool. (laughs) Well, Ryan, I do hate to say, but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking. I want to thank you so much for coming back on the show. Oh, hell yeah, man. Anytime. It's, it's always fun to talk to you and you know, it's God, it's just good to be doing this again, man. It just, it feels great. And I'm, I'm glad your smiling mug was one of the first I got to talk to before I let you go. Where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is, you know, how this ends and anything else you'd like to promote? Sure. Um, So the easiest place to find, you know, how this ends right now uh, is to just go through Barnes and Noble and type that in the search bar and you'll find it. It's also available on Gumroad and I don't know, probably eight or nine other of like the inner library uh, digital stuff like Overdrive and all of that. 
It's at this exact moment, which is December 30th. It's not on Amazon. As a young author, I'm still trying to break through their parameters to get it approved. It could be any day now. It could be up this morning and I wouldn't know it. It could be three weeks. So not sure on that one, but right now Barnes and Noble. And if you want to follow my work or see anything else, uh, it's just my name, ryanfisherdesigns.com. You can download the book there as well as see any of my illustration work, you know, poster illustrations. I do a lot of that right now, past graphic novels, things like that you can find there. Uh, so that's kind of my one hub at this moment. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O, not the number two. Of course, the website's going through a revamp. It feels like for 10 years or so. But go to our YouTube channel because that is definitely a lot more updated than our website. is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back after 12 or so years. You can find that at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search for Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. <laughs>